Sleep paralysis is a devastating condition. When I was seven, I first had sleep paralysis. My mother tucked me in that night. I could remember the citrus fragrance of her perfume. Her scent always comforted me. After she tucked me in, I quickly drifted off to sleep. The night seemed quiet, but the peaceful atmosphere in my bedroom didn't last. I woke up around midnight. A smothering sweat drenched my small body. I couldn't move my arms and legs. I could only move my eyes and my lips. It took my eyes some time to adjust to the thick darkness in my room. While my eyes were struggling to see, that's when I heard it. I could hear it snorting, a dreadful feeling coming over me when I heard the inhuman sound. I could see someone standing in my closet after my eyes adjusted. It peeked at me from behind my closet door. It stood there for a minute, snorting at me. When it lurched out of my closet, I finally saw its full body shape. Its elongated arms stretched out like tree branches. It was tall, but it had a feminine shape. It looked like a deformed, seven-foot-tall, naked woman. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. It felt like something paralyzed my vocal cords. After this shadowy figure stepped out of my closet, it stood in the corner of my room with its arms out. It would release a guttural snorting sound every few minutes. The sound was sickening. It reminded me of someone hawking and spitting on the ground. I could see this figure. I'm listening to the horrible noises it makes while I'm paralyzed. The moonlight came in through my bedroom window. It illuminated a part of the shadowy woman's arm. Her skin looked like mud. It didn't look burnt, just darker than dirt. All I could see was her one arm stretched out across the bedroom wall, bathed in moonlight. My mind kept trying to figure out what she was. I thought I was looking at a demon for the first time, or possibly the devil. Movements occurred, but not for me. I still couldn't move my body, no matter how hard I tried. It felt like invisible hands were holding my arms and legs down. The movement came from the shadowy woman. I watched in horror as she made a step towards the foot of my bed. She would take one step, and then she'd hesitate for a moment before taking another. Her awkward hesitation sent more chills through my body than her measured baby steps. I knew she was going to kill me if I didn't move. Frustration tortured me just as bad as my fears. I didn't know what this thing was or why it was in my bedroom. I didn't know what it wanted. The scary stories that my dad told me about the boogeyman came back to me. So I had this naked creature creeping towards me while thinking about my dad's stories and how he told me the boogeyman captures children at night and they never come back. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dad. I wanted to move so badly. I wanted to scream. It felt like I was fighting my body. The voice in my mind yelled at my body, telling it to move. The dark woman mocked me with her hesitant steps. She inched closer and closer to the foot of my bed with her arms stretched wide open. A crazy thought went through my head. Since I couldn't move my body, I thought maybe the feeling would be numb. I assumed the creature would viciously attack me, but at least I wouldn't feel pain. I could see her long fingernails pointing out to me, and I knew those fingernails would be the first thing to dig into my body. No pain. Please, no pain. This is what I kept telling myself. Just be calm, Miranda. When the monster grabs you, you won't feel it. It won't hurt. Your body is numb, so you won't feel anything. Tears were in my eyes while I was telling myself this. I wanted my mom to save me. I wanted to see my mom's face, and I wanted to smell her perfume. I wanted to call out to my dad. My dad told me to never be afraid of anything, and that's what I tried to do. Time was running out for me. My urge to move was so strong that I started imagining that I could move my arms and legs. I thought I could move my arms, but it was just a hallucination. This was torture. Why was this happening to me? I was just a kid. I had just turned seven, and now I was going to die on the day after my birthday? I'll never go to high school, meet new friends, I'll never graduate from college, I'll never get married, I'll never find out what it's like to be a mom. The best thing I could do was close my eyes. I didn't want to see it attack me. I just buried my eyelids behind the tears. I said a prayer that my mom had taught me. My lips and my voice were still useless, so I had to say the prayer in my head. The prayer repeated in my mind. My mom and dad taught me to believe in God. I needed God to save me. My mother always told me I was God's child, and he had angels watching over me. I wanted his angel to save me that night, and I didn't see him. 
A demon was making its way towards my bed, and God was just going to sit there and watch it kill his child? My young mind couldn't understand what was happening. I thought the dark figure was a demon, a little girl who knew for sure she would die in her bed. More chills traveled up and down my spine when I opened my eyes to see the giant shadow woman standing over the foot of my bed. She changed her position. Before I closed my eyes, her arms were spread out as if she wanted to hug me. When I opened my eyes, she was standing motionless in front of me, her long fingers over her lips. She was telling me not to make a sound. I couldn't make a sound anyway, so when I saw her holding her fingers to her lips, it didn't matter to me. My situation turned upside down when I heard something else. Something unexpected happened. There was evil in my room, but the evil that stepped into my room was not the shadow woman. I remembered hearing news stories about missing children in town. My mom wouldn't let me out of her sight whenever we went to the store. There were reports of a crazed man in a clown costume going around abducting children. The police were searching for him. They couldn't find him, but they found his aftermath. They found two missing children dead in a wooded area. As a child, I couldn't completely comprehend the danger. When you're a kid, you want to play with your friends. I wanted to play with the other little girls in the neighborhood, but my mom would always keep me close to her side. On my birthday, I went to an amusement park, but I couldn't enjoy myself because I would go from being in my mom's arms to being in my dad's arms, constantly being carried around the park like a doll. I hated the smothering, overprotective behavior by my mother. She passed her paranoia to my father, who would normally allow freedom in my playtime. My childhood freedom ended for a little while because of a child-killing bastard. Somehow, the killer entered our home through the basement window. He stayed hidden in our house for two days. This is how he broke into other people's houses, and he would hack into alarm systems and shut them off. Most of the missing children's news reports involved children being taken from their homes in the dead of night without their parents even knowing what happened. A few days later, their children's naked bodies would be found in a nearby pond or in a dumpster. Mothers and fathers were losing their babies to a middle-aged, six-and-a-half, 250-pound psychopath in a clown outfit. We didn't know that the psychopathic clown broke into our home two days ago. We didn't know he was hiding in the basement. I was only a child, so he thought one little girl in the house would be easy prey. He picked the wrong house that night. I heard him creeping down the hallway right outside my bedroom door. His footsteps were quiet, but clumsy. The hardwood floor in the hall would always creak. My bedroom door creaked open, and I saw his tall shadow hunched over in the doorway. I remembered hearing my pounding heart, my eyes shifting between the killer clown and the dark shadow woman. I couldn't believe I was seeing these two nightmarish figures standing in my bedroom. One figure was evil, while the other was good. He was wearing clown makeup, he had a red painted nose, and he wore a pair of sunglasses over his chalky white face. I could see he had a beard, he had a pink afro wig, and he was shirtless. He had an imposing physique like a wrestler. I also saw a massive tattoo of a wolf's face on his chest. The large butcher's knife he clutched in his right hand immediately caught my eye. Even in the darkness, I could see the knife's serrated blade gleaming. He was so big that he blocked out my doorway. I didn't know what to do. There was nothing I could do. Just lay there, helpless. I started imagining that I could scream for help. My imagination was cruel, it seemed. I hated my body for not moving. I hated my voice for not letting me scream. I knew I was awake because he spoke to me. Hi there, little princess. I'm your new friend. Your mommy went away and asked me to take care of you. When he said my mom went away, my heart sunk deep in my chest. As he got closer to my bed, I could see something dripping off the knife, and I didn't want to know what it was. When the child killer spoke to me, his voice didn't fit his body. His voice sounded androgynous. It had a deceptively feminine quality. It's terrifying to see a mountainous man in clown makeup talk softly down to you through a teenage girl's voice. I kept thinking about Pennywise from the movie It, but imagine Pennywise if he was shirtless with the body of Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I closed my eyes again when I saw the killer towering over my bed, getting ready to swing down with that butcher's knife at my face. I expected to feel cold, sharp steel slice through my nose, but none of that happened. 
I shut my eyes, but I couldn't keep them shut for long. The child killer had so much of my attention that I'd forgotten about the shadow woman, who was still standing at the foot of my bed. I remembered hearing the man scream out a curse word, and then I heard a snap. I could still make out through the darkness what was happening. I saw the killer clown's arm hanging in another direction. I'll never forget his guttural, blood-curdling scream as it pierced my ears. His scream echoed throughout our home. I thought that even the neighbors could hear him. What happened next made me almost pass out from shock. I saw the dark shadow woman lifting the child killer by the throat. She hurled him into the wall, and a penetrating thud shook my bedroom. I kept hearing the man begging for his life, and he sounded so pathetic. He just kept screaming out, What are you? Please don't kill me, ma'am. But the dark woman had no pity for him. She bludgeoned him with his knife. I watched her break both his legs. She punched him in the chest so hard that I heard bones and chest cave in. I heard his rib cage cracking. After a few minutes, his verbal pleading became whimpering moans of agony. I didn't know that you could break bones in a human body in so many ways. After twisting the bones around in his arms and shattering the bones in his knees, I watched the dark woman raise the child killer off his feet again. She held him over her head before shoving the butcher's knife into his throat, nailing him to the wall quite literally. I never blinked as I stared at what had happened to the killer. I almost felt sorry for the sick son of a bitch. No, not really though. The dark lady made him pay for all the children he had abducted. She made him pay for his attempt to kill me. After the violence ended in my bedroom, I watched as the shadow woman moved towards my bed. She stuck out her arms again while moving towards me. It looked like she was floating in slow motion. My heart was still pounding, even when I felt her clawed fingers breezing through my hair. When she touched my face, I could smell a familiar fragrance. It was that citrus aroma from my mother's perfume. I couldn't understand why the shadow figure smelled like my mother. I didn't understand it until later. The shadow woman hovered over me. Her lips stroked my forehead. She caressed my face for a few minutes, and then she vanished when I heard my father's panicking voice coming from downstairs. I didn't want to believe that I saw blood on the killer's knife, but it was blood. It was my mother's blood. That asshole stabbed my mother to death right before he made his way upstairs towards my bedroom. He left my mother's body lying in the kitchen. My father stepped out of the house to get a few things at the store. When he came back home an hour later, he found my mom's body lying in a pool of blood. Her lavender, sleeveless nightgown was soaked in red. My father cried out when he saw her body. I heard him running up the stairs, crying out my name. When he bolted into my room, I was already in his arms before he could switch on the bedroom light. He saw the man's body nailed to the wall and lost his breath. I told him what happened and what I had seen. He couldn't believe it, but he had no choice. He knew that a little girl didn't have the strength to nail a 250-pound man to the wall. My father called the police, and when they arrived, they asked me a few questions. I told them everything. Like my father, they stared at me. A policewoman caressed my face and said, It's okay, sweetie. You had a traumatic experience. Who you saw in your bedroom was just a good Samaritan wearing a costume. None of the police officers believed that I saw a dark shadow woman. They all believed that my trauma caused me to hallucinate. They even told me I might have seen my father killing the man, and I told them my father wasn't in the house. He had told my mother that he was going to the store. I heard him kiss my mom before he left the house. Those cops didn't believe my story. They had tons of sympathy for me, but I wanted my mother more than I wanted sympathy. I missed my mom, and I couldn't stop thinking about her fragrance. I found the perfume she wore while moving some boxes around in the attic. That sweet fragrance took me back to that night. I believe the dark figure I saw in my bedroom that night was my mother, a dead version of her. I'm 36 years old now, and I think about my mother every day. I got married to a kind and beautiful man, and we had a son. My little boy is five years old, and he has his mother's hazel eyes and his daddy's dimples. I try to be an excellent mother, and I'm very protective of my little one, just like my own mother was protective of me. Every night I tuck my son in bed and read him a bedtime story. One night, I told him about what had happened to his mom when she was seven years old. He looked scared after I told him the story. My son is afraid of the dark, but I told him not to worry. I told him that his mother's love will protect him and can reach beyond death even. I told him I'd always be there to protect him. I told my baby not to be frightened if he sees a dark shadow woman standing in the corner of his bedroom. I told him 
She'll watch over him while he sleeps. I also told him not to panic if he wakes up suddenly, unable to move his body. Sleep paralysis is scary at first, but I told my son that his paralysis will be a sign, letting him know that the Shadow Woman is there to protect him from things that go bump in the night. There was one thing I didn't tell him, though. I didn't tell him that the Black Shadow Woman standing in the corner of his bedroom might be his mommy if she dies the way her mother did. We used to have to take the corpses out with a crane, he told me once, because they were so intertwined. Entire pyramids of bodies, people were climbing on top of one another, clawing each other to get away from the gas. They used to tell us it was a quick death, but everyone knew it wasn't. The screaming in the chamber would go on for 15 or 20 minutes. They used to put a little glass window in the door so the doctor could look in and watch. My grandfather, Alexander, had told me about his time in the Zonder Commando, the corpse units of the National Socialist Concentration Camps. He had been arrested in Poland simply because he'd been a leader in his field and an intellectual with a history of supporting Polish nationalism. This had raised red flags, and during a roundup of the intelligentsia, my grandfather had also been arrested and tortured by the Gestapo. They had made him sign something that he never got to read. Then he had been moved to prison and, eventually, to his new job. The day it happened... My friend, Bartok, and I were on duty. Our job was to lead the people towards the chambers without alerting them or causing a riot. The Zonderkommandos are used lines like, Don't forget where you put your clothes because you'll need to come back to them, or tie your shoes together for convenience to make it easier to find them when you come back. We always emphasized how they would come back after the shower, but... I never looked them in the eye when I said it. He stared out the window for a long moment after this, his mug of coffee steaming in front of him. I knew not to interrupt him. He often talked to me about his experiences. It seemed like he wanted to draw poison out of his memories, and letting him talk seemed to help him do it. So the chamber was packed, as always. Eight hundred people smashed into a tiny area, like sardines. To get the last one in, the SS would often beat and bludgeon people. The claustrophobia must have been horrifying. The lack of air. The packed chamber, like a massive coffin. By the time they slammed the door closed, there wasn't an extra inch of space into the entire chamber. In fact, after they opened the door, their bodies would often still be standing because there was simply no room for them to fall down, except for the middle of the chamber, of course. There, people lived the longest. They tried to escape from the gas. We would see infants and small children at the bottom of human pyramids, smothered and stampeded. The stronger ones would be at the top, having climbed over the bodies of others to try and get some air at the top of the chamber. The gas did have a tendency to fall, depending on the temperature and the humidity. When they opened the doors, Bartok and I walked in among the others of the Zonderkommando. We used long canes to pull the bodies out. At first, the Zonderkommando would treat the bodies with respect, but after tens of thousands of bodies, you just started throwing them like bags of potatoes. It was our job, after all. He said it with an ironic misery, his eyes getting misty. Bartok and I would then pile the bodies on carts as we brought them to the other teams of Zonderkommandos. One team, which we called the dentists, would rip out the gold teeth so they could melt them down into bars and send them back to Germany. Another would shave all the remaining hair off the corpses. They'd shaved them when they first got there, but... Any remainder would make the crematorium reek of burning hair. Bartok and I were moving our carts of corpses up the lift elevator, 
when a commotion suddenly broke out in a nearby medical barracks. They called it a medical barracks, but in reality it was mostly a place where doctors experimented on people, where the sick were often given lethal doses of this chemical or that. This also wasn't a quick death, as the person would begin to get agonizing cramps and a burning sensation before devolving into unconsciousness. I had no idea what was going on. First, I thought the SS were trying to prevent a prisoner escape, or maybe someone had already escaped and they were in an uproar. It looked like someone had kicked a hornet's nest. I saw government vehicles speeding in with fully armed troops. The guards surrounded the gates of the camp, a thick ring of black-suited soldiers. I saw a doctor running out of the barracks, blood covering his white lab coat. His eyes looked wild, and he screamed something in German to the soldiers. He kept screaming it over and over again. Die, Wolfen! Die, Wolfen! he said. Most of the Zonderkommandos, including myself, knew at least a little German. It was, after all, the administrative language of the National Socialist State, and the Germans never deigned to speak to us in our language unless they were torturing us or trying to get information. By this time, Bartok and I had paused, a cart full of emaciated naked corpses lying in front of us. The doctor ran past us, not noticing, his eyes wild. He continued to scream gibberish in German, speaking so fast I could barely understand anything except for two words, the girl and the wolf. What the hell do you think that's about? Bartok asked me, his blue eyes wide and uncertain. I just shook my head, feeling numb. I hadn't felt much of anything in months, to be honest. I had closed myself down emotionally, psychologically removing myself from the present. I saw much of this as if it were happening to someone else. In my mind, I think I was trying to protect myself. Even now... Looking back, I feel like I'm telling someone else's story sometimes. A torrent of gunfire erupted from the medical barracks, and then a woman ran out. It was a nurse, and her face looked like a mask of gore. One eye hung limply from its socket, and her entire left cheek was hung down in ribbons, a flap of skin revealing the teeth behind, like some sort of grotesque half-smile. In a remaining eye, I saw mortal terror and fear. Seeing it coming from our captors loosened something inside me. Bartok felt the same way. We left our carts of dead and turned to run. At that moment, something tore its way out of the barracks. As I saw what it was, I began running with all the energy that my starving body could provide. It was a girl... At least, it had been. She looked no older than twelve or thirteen, and she wore a striped uniform, soaked in blood. Her arms and legs lengthened before my eyes, forming long claws that erupted from her fingers. Her mouth had formed into a strange, rictus grin, with drops of blood falling from her sharpening teeth. Stringy black hair seemed to be growing from her head, and her eyes, her eyes, they were turning yellow, with slitted demonic pupils gleaming in the center, emanating a bloodlust and fury that I'd never seen before. The SS guards and soldiers had streamed in from the front gate by this point, running at her and shouting orders. Automatic rifles began to fire, and Bartok grabbed my hand and pulled me down to the ground just in time. I heard bullets whizzing over my head, smashing into the crematorium chimney and the surrounding barracks. I knew they weren't shooting at me, but so many soldiers had opened fire that the entire area had turned into a shooting gallery. I looked back and saw bullets ripping into the girl's body. 
Gore blossomed from her chest, blood and flesh exploding out of exit wounds, covering the bare dirt around her. With a roar, she jumped on top of the barracks, leaping twenty feet into the air. To my amazement, I watched the wounds healing before my eyes. I wondered what kind of strange medical experiment this was that could produce such an effect. Bartok shook me, saying we had to run, we had to get out, but I just stood there, shell-shocked. He slapped me, pulling me up and towards the gas chamber. We can barricade ourselves inside the chamber, he said. I gasped. I'm not going to lock myself in there, I shouted, waves of anxiety rising in my chest. I had images of the door slamming closed and Zyklon B being poured through the vents. I shuddered, but we kept running towards it, not knowing where else to go. As we got inside the crematoria, the windows smashed inward, and I saw the girl had followed us. She'd completely transformed by this point. Her skin looked yellow and papery against the long, wolfish frame. Tatters of the blood-stained uniform still clung to her body. I saw no marks from where the bullets had struck her. She ran towards us, lashing out with clawed hands. Bartok pushed me just in time, and I fell, the claw missing my face by a fraction of an inch. I began to crawl away, looking back at Bartok as he began to cry out in terror. I looked and saw him backing away from her his hands raised, pleading. I don't want to die. I don't want to die, he kept saying. In a blur, she leapt forward, ripping at his throat, the bloody rictus grin still plastered across her face. A torrent of blood rushed out from the gaping wound, soaking the front of his body. She opened her mouth wide and drank the spouting arterial stream, sucking at it as she held up his body with her clawed hands. When she was done, she threw it aside and looked down at me. I had begun to rise, to jump up and run when she tackled me from behind. I felt a searing pain in my back as her claws connected, leaving deep gouges. I felt something sticky and warm flowing down my back soaking into the rips in my uniform. At that point, a dozen SS men ran in through the front door and began shooting. I was on the floor after she had clawed me, which turned out to be lucky, as the bullets went right over me. Hissing and spitting blood, I turned my head at the last moment to see the girl galloping away from me on all fours, her freakish long arms giving her a lopsided stride. She jumped back through the shattered window she'd come in. The SS men all ran out after her, and I found myself alone with Bartok's body. I got up and found the rest of the prisoners confined to their barracks with armed guards watching each of the groups. The guards had left the front of the camp in a hurry, and I saw that the gates stood wide open. With blood pouring down my back, I began to creep through the shadows of the camp, checking the watchtowers and the front gates for people. They had all joined in the pursuit, or were with the confined prisoners in their barracks, and they had apparently forgotten about a lone Zonder commando like myself. I finally made my way outside. I didn't see a single other prisoner or guard in the front, but when I looked back, before I left for the final time, I saw the girl leaping over the razor wire fence as countless soldiers pursued her. Good for you, I said to myself. Good for you. The emergency alert on my phone went off with a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily, just as I was bringing the last of my stuff into the cabin. I took the device out of my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for about a minute before realizing that I'd have to leave. 
only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again. Severe weather alert. Heavy snowfall in the Frontiac region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck on the road in the blizzard, but subsequently meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, messages started coming in from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone as I opened it. Matt, did you see the emergency alert about the storm? I guess the trip's off. What a bunch of crap. Ted, OMFG, a generational storm is what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone it a few weeks. I hope you didn't go through with your plan to go up a day early, Jay. Greg, no kidding. What are the chances this blizzard hits on our ice fishing weekend? I messaged back saying I understood we'd have to reschedule. I told them that I made the trip up alone, accompanying the message with forehead slapping emojis. It sucks that I'll be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog Gibson pawed at my leg and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. Not completely alone. At least I've got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small brick stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it, and a small bag containing kindling which we'd brought with us in the summer and left behind. At first glance, it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience I'd need twice as much as it appeared to make to get through the night, so I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There's no running water, no electricity, and the cabin's poorly insulated. Perennially, procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in slight trickles of cold air from outside. It was drafty, and I could hear the sound of mice which had made their way through the gaps, burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into our old coats or sleeping bags or something that we'd left behind. I sighed as I lit the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having vermin in the cottage that set me on edge, but at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with warm, flickering light from a half dozen kerosene lamps, I felt a little better. There was reassurance in having fire, and I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm throughout the night. I loosely wadded up some newspaper and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood, until I had piled it to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight in several places, watching as it began to burn and then flared up in a bright white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and warmed myself up. Eventually, I took off my boots and my coat, the entire cottage getting a little toasty. There's no sense unpacking, I thought, taking a beer out of the cooler and opening it. I took a sip and couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried the brand before, and I picked it up on recommendation. It was awful, and lukewarm to boot. Par for the course, considering the trip so far. Took out my phone and watched some Netflix while beer went flat beside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me so that she was off the floor and close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually, I got bored of office reruns and called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon even closer to the stove so that it was close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber, constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm but not really succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson's trembling form on the bed beside me. I was so cold that I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably, and I realized a few hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. I put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking as well. My hands were 
trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling on the fire, blowing it into embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen, and my heart was beating fast, my skin prickling with pins and needles, turning it into a total numbness in my extremities. I'd never, I'd never felt so cold in my life. I realized I was far beyond the weather forecast for tomorrow. It seemed like it was minus 30 degrees and steadily dropping further. Terrified that I wouldn't be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it would be impossible to start the fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside and I could get in there and start it up, turning on the heat until I felt warm again. The idea of getting out there and the truck refusing to start was too much to take though. Considering the state of the beat up old Ford, that seemed like a distinct possibility. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often until the tiny flame had begun to grow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gibson closer, we shared each other's warmth and I began to feel halfway human again. A sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump. My heart skipped a beat, then pounded faster and faster in my chest. A noise like fingernails being dragged along the siding could be heard from all around. Echoing in the small space, something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons along the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me, and I put my hands over her muzzle, muffling her sound. Was it a bear, I wondered? I realized... I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin, the spot beneath the bed where mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the wooden one behind that which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden, and I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was breathing heavily just outside, trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook from the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out at first as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone. Then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot, I, I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with wary eyes, taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up, I didn't notice at first. It was dark in the cottage one minute, and then it was light. I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I would waste no more time leaving. I was hoping the bear, or whatever had been outside the night before, was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me it was probably safe. In the light of the morning, all that had happened seemed to be a bad nightmare, and I told myself maybe it had been, until I got outside and saw the claw marks that marked the exterior wall. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a weekend this had turned out to be. I thought to myself, with more people around, it would be easier to keep the fire going, taking turns feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter, and I never would again. There were too many things that could go wrong. A freak snowstorm, a fallen tree blocking the road, getting stuck or going into a ditch, and those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things happened. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only the click of the absence of any engine noise. Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure I hadn't left the interior lights on or something which would drain the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried one more time, 
and finally the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. All right, Gibson, let's get out of here, I said, rubbing my dog's head and smiling as she blinked at me. She looked content in the front seat, happy to be back in the truck and out of the cold cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road, and the tires moved easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning gray above us. A few snowflakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio, and sure enough, they said the same thing I was thinking. The storm would be arriving early. By noon, the highways would be a parking lot. Whiteout conditions. Be prepared to be trapped in your car. Have emergency services ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the road. Hitting the gas, I came to the first big hill and went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive. Brown. The lumpy fur shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear, which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before, was dead. Lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. First, I thought it had frozen to death. I got out of my truck and inspected it and was surprised to find there was... A horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a chemical smell, noxious and unpleasant, like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast, the blood and entrails pooling around the far side. What the hell could have done something like this? Aren't bears at the top of the food chain? Alpha predators? Gibson was by my side, but she didn't venture anywhere near the body. Usually she would have gotten curious, trying to sniff at it or something like that, but she stayed next to me, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There was no way out, not unless I could move it. No matter which way I attempted it, the giant body of the dead bear would not budge. It weighed a ton. There were large trees on either side of the road, so close to the driving path. There was only one way out, which was by driving across the frozen lake. And that was way risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable, but there was a clear way on and off the ice if it came down to it. I got back in the truck and threw it in reverse since there was nowhere to turn around. I felt sick to my stomach, nervous with anticipation and fear, uncertain of how things were going to play out. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of the truck and went down to the ice with my spud. Walking out onto the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig. I dug with the sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I'd found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure, my heart sank. The ice was barely seven inches thick just below the minimum eight inches where it would be safe to drive a vehicle across. My truck was on the heavy side, and I wouldn't feel comfortable unless it was a full foot thick. I pulled out my phone and checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Who would I call? I wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. Of course, I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bars were down to zero and the words no service were printed over the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe warning alert otherwise, because snow was now being dumped down on me from above, and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat, telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience that it would go through eventually. I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine, her tone rising in volume as she began to bark. High, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what she had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk too high up, the nails too long and too sharp to be a person. Whatever this giant was, it 
looked similar to a man, but it was massive. It peered out at me from beneath the boughs of the trees, its head probably 15 feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it, a gray, pale, white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I could make out its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the gray light coming through the clouds. And then I saw its mouth spread wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and it disappeared back into the darkness. The temperature felt like it had dropped to 30 below again, and I began to shiver involuntarily as I looked down to see Gibson doing the same. There was only one choice, only one place we could go, back to the cabin. It was either that or risk plunging the truck into the frozen lake, attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula surrounded by water on all sides, only one way in and one way out, and that way was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest, I asked myself over and over again, but no answers came to mind. There were no creatures I could think of that were 15 feet tall with reflective eyes that stood on two legs like a man, capable of disemboweling a full-grown brown bear, capable of causing the temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that, and it wasn't supposed to exist. It was something from myth, from folklore, from legends that weren't supposed to be real. It's a wendigo, I said out loud, immediately regretting the words as if Saying them made them true, as if saying them would summon it. Wendigos are supernatural creatures born of Canadian First Nation folklore. They live in cold, remote places and make people go mad merely through their presence. They thrive on hunger, despair, and loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities. They drive families apart, instilling urges of cannibalism in people and making them want to consume their loved ones. During the lean, hard months of the winter, this usually happens, they turn people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones, and then once they're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing flesh from your bones while you beg and scream, or it turns you into one of its own kind. But the Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller and more emaciated. Its hunger grows more insatiable with its height, until it's a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gibson whimpered and burrowed her face into my armpit as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stroked her fur and told her it'd be okay, although I had a feeling it wouldn't. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it, knowing we might be stuck here for a while. Pretty soon, the wind was howling and blowing outside, and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of opening it every so often to clear the snow from the steps, knowing that I would need firewood taking weary glances off into the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally, I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove, which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp, but I kept feeding it fresh kindling, nursing it, until it was, until it was able to keep going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling, and the sun was beginning to set. My stomach rumbled with hunger when I felt something strange. The ground suddenly shook beneath my feet, and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it, girl? I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining room table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer and I imagined the creature lifting the roof off a cabin like a top on a dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up and eating me whole like a wriggling shrimp. 
A second later, there was a sound at the front door, metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash, and then the wooden door was being torn from its hinges an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I heard the thing tearing apart the front entrance, easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon I could find nearby, thinking I could throw it at the thing's face to defend us, when I heard a strange noise from the front. It was a car horn honking. Someone had come to save me. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat, indicating that at some point it had gone through, at some brief moment when there'd been a gap in the clouds. Reading the new messages brought a hopeful smile across my face. Matt, you just had to skip town a day early and go ice fishing, didn't you? What the hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay, are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside, which I realized had come from the monster. They had actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked out, seeing the creature for the first time. It stood with its back to us, its head among the treetops, even taller than it appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now it was fully aware of them, and it was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage, and I realized that one of my friends had gotten out of the car and they were using themselves as bait so that I could flee the cottage safely. They had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guess that they'd run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear which blocked the road. Jay! Ted screamed out the window, driving the car in a circle on the ice, as if too terrified to stay still. I raced over to the car, slipping and sliding on the ice, it was Matt who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large, too fast. He didn't know what he was dealing with, but that was Matt. He was always act first and think later kind of guy. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look at me and gave a thumbs up, his attention diverted from the creature for a split second. As Gibson and I got into the car, we heard his scream. I looked up to see the Wendigo close the distance in an instant and was picking him up like an insect, turning him over and beginning to bite him. As Matt screamed for help, the creature peeled off his skin, exposed his skull as it ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles and wet choking sounds, and I nearly got out of the car to run after him, but Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. You can't save him. He said with wet rimmed eyes and eventually I relented. We raced our way across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath off the fresh fallen snow on our way back to mainland. For a while, we debated what to do. Should we call the police? Our friend had just died after all, but we knew that if we did, we'd be considered suspects. And with no other reasonable explanation, they'd pin his death on us. They'd say we'd killed him. There were no boxes they could check on an official police report citing a Wendigo attack. So, since such things didn't exist, being myths and legends, we'd be their only suspect. As it turned out, we didn't have to worry about it, though. A message popped up from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home, and I had to tell myself that it wasn't all just a nightmare, a hallucination from the cold and lack of sleep and food. But Ted and Greg both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real, as much as I wish it wasn't. The three of us read the message on the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast, and a sick knot was growing in my stomach, bile rising in my throat that I could taste inside my mouth. Hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard if not more so. Let's reschedule the trip for next week, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we didn't want to go, we've resolved that we have to. We can't leave Matt like that. We have to help him. Next week, we're making the trip back up there. 
even if it kills us. The taxi jolted to a stop in front of the hotel, a monolith of grandeur and forgotten glamour. I paid the driver and stepped out, scanning the facade that had stood the test of time, hiding within the walled secrets that the city had tried to bury. My name's Michael Turner. I'm a detective by trade and obsession. I guess you could call me grizzled, hardened by years of chasing shadows in this unforgiving city. Today, I was to face an enigma that had danced just out of reach of law enforcement for decades. Room 313. As I walked towards the ornate entrance, memories of my last failed investigation ambushed me. I blinked against the sudden sting in my eyes. Emily, my partner and the more optimistic half of our duo, was gone. Our last case had taken her away, stolen by a faceless criminal we'd never managed to apprehend. Her loss was was a wound, fresh and raw, and it had only served to drive my determination deeper. Not for revenge, but for justice, for answers. And that's what led me to room 313. Check-in was smooth, the concierge barely betrayed any surprise when I requested the key to the infamous room. His eyes held a flicker of something, though. Pity, Maybe fear? Doesn't matter. I grabbed the key and headed towards the elevator, the gleaming brass number 313 engraved on it, a constant reminder of my purpose. The hallway leading to 313 was surprisingly mundane. The carpet was dull, nondescript patterns that seemed completely at odds with the stories tied to it. It reminded me of the countless crime scenes I'd been to over the years. The mundane, wrapped around the macabre, Reality, dancing a deadly waltz with the unseen. I slid the key into the lock, the door creaking open, that had become a character in the city's darkest nightmares. I dropped my bag by the bed, the simple action resonating in the silence. Room 313. How many lives had it claimed? How many stories had it silenced? Each death was a question, each victim a mystery. I stared around, my eyes falling on a picture hanging on the wall. It was an old black and white shot of the hotel. The hotel in its heyday. A beacon of opulence and power. Now a monument to death. I moved to the window, staring out at the sprawling cityscape. Lights twinkled. Life moved on, oblivious to the room of death I now occupied. I couldn't help but think of Emily. Would we have cracked this case together? The thought was bitter, the loss suddenly immeasurable. After setting my bag down, I began the initial survey of room 313. My eyes swept across every inch of the room, every corner, every crevice, looking for clues. Anything could be a clue, a piece of a decades-old puzzle that had eluded so many before me. As I walked deeper into the room, I couldn't shake off the cold draft that seemed to follow me. It wasn't a steady, natural current, but erratic gusts that made the thin curtains flutter like disturbed spirits. I went over to the window, expecting to find it slightly ajar, but it was sealed shut, the paint around the edges thick and uncracked. The chill wasn't coming from outside. It was emanating from within the room itself. There was a peculiar hum in the air, a low, throbbing vibration that tickled the back of my skull. It was almost imperceptible, drowned out by the muted sounds of the city below. But in the quiet moments, between the distant honks of traffic and the occasional murmur of hotel staff in the corridors, I could hear it, persistent, unyielding. Next came the lights. They flickered with a life of their own, dancing shadows across the wall in a haunting ballet. Initially, I chalked it up to the hotel's old wiring, but there was a rhythm to it, a pattern that sent shivers down my spine. They seemed to react, 
dimming when I ventured towards certain corners, brightening when I approached others. And then there was the noise, soft whispers that drifted through the room, incoherent but palpable, a sudden clattering like something metallic dropping on the floor, even though nothing seemed out of place, the distant sound of children's laughter, chilling in its mirth. None of it made sense, yet all of it set my nerves on edge. I spent hours documenting everything, the cold drafts, the lights, the sounds. My recorder never left my side, a faithful companion that captured the eerie symphony of room 313. Yet as I sat on the edge of the ancient bed, the weight of the room's history pressing down on me, I felt a flicker of doubt. Could I really do this? Could I solve a mystery that seemed more rooted in the supernatural than the physical? As darkness fell and the strange noises of 313 grew louder, I slipped into a fitful sleep. With it came the dreams, though dreams feels like too soft a word. These were nightmares, woven with the tragic tapestry of room 313's history. Each night I found myself in a different area, witnessing events that I knew were reenactments of the murders that had made 313 famous. I was there, but not as myself, rather an invisible bystander, forced to watch the horror unfold with grim helplessness. One night I stood in the room as it was in 1940. I watched in horror as a woman in a flapper dress was strangled by an unseen force. Her terrified eyes locked onto mine as she clawed at her throat, her gasps for air growing weaker until they were no more. Another night I was back in the 60s. A businessman was pacing nervously in the room. Suddenly the lights went out, and when they flickered back, his lifeless body lay sprawled on the floor, his eyes wide open in an eternal stare of fear. Each dream was a horrific puzzle piece, a chilling glimpse into the atrocities that Room 313 had witnessed. They weren't just dreams, they were echoes of the past, reaching out to me, pleading for me to uncover their truth. While they provided crucial insights into each murder, they also took a heavy toll on my mental health. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, my heart pounding, the echoes of their final screams still lingering in my ears. Each morning was a struggle to pull myself together, to remind myself of the task at hand, of the justice these souls deserved. The boundaries between sleep and wakefulness started to blur, and the shadows of Room 313 seemed to creep into my consciousness even during the day. The constant whispering, the flickering lights, the reoccurring nightmares began to gnaw at my sanity. My hands shook as I poured over my notes, the victims' faces merging into one another, their terror becoming my own. The distinction between night and day began to blur in Room 313 as the supernatural happenings became my reality. The room, like an entity in its own right, started revealing itself to me. Ghostly apparitions began to manifest during the waking hours, their eternal forms flickering in and out of existence, like phantoms caught in a limbo between the past and the present. A spectral woman in a flapper dress would point to a hidden compartment under the bed, leading me to a pearl necklace, her eyes filled with a desperate plea. The translucent figure of the businessman from the 60s would appear next to the window, his hands reaching out towards the view outside, where a long-forgotten sign revealed the name of his company. Each apparition led me towards clues, their spectral guidance a chilling beacon in the darkness. As I pieced together their stories, their ties to room 313, an eerie pattern began to emerge. The victims, all from different eras, shared one commonality, their birthday. Strange enough, it was the same as mine, a chilling coincidence that sent a shiver down my spine. It was as if 313 had chosen me, not just to reveal its secrets, 
but also to tie me to it in a deadly narrative. It seemed impossible, surreal even, but the evidence was right there. Birth certificates, diaries, newspaper clippings, all painting a chilling picture of shared fates and cursed timelines. It was like a dark thread spun from the loom of destiny, binding all of us to room 313. My heart pounded in my chest as I sat amidst the clues, the links, the ghostly echoes of shared birthdays. I couldn't help but wonder what it meant. Was I just another character in this twisted tale? My fate tied to room 313, just like the victims before me? Or was I here to break the cycle? To finally shed light on the dark enigma that had claimed so many lives. As I delved deeper into the mystery of room 313, an undercurrent of unease grew stronger, wrapping itself around the room like a chilling shroud. The once benign whispers turned into malicious growls. The temperature dropped dramatically, and an ominous feeling of being watched began to haunt me. One afternoon, I was flipping through a victim's diary, and the room's chandelier began to swing violently, almost as if in protest. Before I could react, the heavy fixture plummeted down, crashing onto the spot where I'd been sitting seconds ago. The close call left my heart pounding in my chest, my mind grappling with the reality and the danger I'd narrowly avoided. The very next day, while I was studying the faded pictures of a victim, an icy gust of wind whipped through the room, extinguishing the lights. The darkness was suffocating, Im impenetrable. A floorboard creaked, followed by a muffled sound of an approaching entity. I held my breath, feeling an intangible presence closing in. As a searing pain shot through my arm, I ignited my flashlight, revealing a shard of glass slicing into my skin. A mere second later, and it could have pierced my heart. Each encounter with the room's vengeful spirits left me with a chilling realization. The ghosts of Room 313 were growing more hostile. Their spectral warnings had turned into lethal threats. It was as if they were warning me off, their spectral forms forming deadly traps around each clue I discovered. But why? Didn't they want me to solve the mystery? Weren't they crying out for justice, their stories begging to be heard? The malevolent resistance puzzled me, only fueling my determination to seek the truth. While going through a trunk filled with old photographs, I stumbled upon an aged black and white picture of a grand party. It was held in room 313, which was far more opulent and lively than its present state. At the center of the revelry stood a distinguished man, no doubt the hotel's founder, surrounded by well-wishers. The back of the photograph bore the date, the same birthday that connected me, the founder, and the victims. An unsettling realization dawned upon me. Room 313 was where the hotel's founder, who also shared our peculiar birthday, held his grand birthday celebration. But amidst the joy and the laughter, a dark cloud loomed, a tragedy that would forever taint these walls. In a dusty, forgotten corner of the room, I found a secret drawer camouflaged in the intricate woodwork. It held a leather-bound journal, its pages brittle with age. The script inside revealed the chilling past of room 313. The entries were from the hotel's founder, documenting his life, and more importantly, his birthdays. One entry in particular was smudged with something that looked suspiciously like dried tears. It told a harrowing tale of a birthday party gone horribly wrong, an act of betrayal that ended in a bloody feud, resulting in several deaths, all born on the shared date. The founder himself, guilt-ridden and desolate, met a tragic end within the cursed walls of room 313. A chill ran down my spine. That was the genesis of the curse. The room, steeped in guilt and fury of the bloody birthday event, became a vengeful entity, forever haunted by its past. It was as if the special energies were anchored to that fatal event repeating the cycle of death on a shared date. And here I was, another soul born on that cursed day, 
standing amidst the spectral remains of the past. I was targeted, drawn into this macabre dance of death and hauntings by a date that was supposed to be a cause of celebration. Armed with my newly discovered evidence, I marched to the hotel's management office. The door to the manager's office was imposing, heavy mahogany that spoke of the grandeur this place had once held. I knocked, and the door creaked open, revealing a man hunched over a mountain of paperwork. Detective Turner, what can I do for you, he said, barely glancing up from his desk. I tossed the worn-out journal on top of the paperwork. Explain this, I said, my voice cutting through the silence. He looked startled, his eyes widening as he picked up the old book, leafing through the brittle pages. His face went pale as he read, but he quickly regained his composure. Yes, I'm aware of the room's history, he admitted, choosing his words carefully. The tragic events that took place here are a sad part of the hotel's past. But you didn't think it necessary to inform me of this, I reported, anger flaring in my voice. The room is cursed. It's a death trap for those born on a specific date. My birthday. I assure you, detective, we, we had no knowledge of this birthday curse, he responded, though his gaze wavered, hinting at deceit. We thought the hauntings were just uh, urban legend. But the clues added up differently. The man was lying. The hotel had been capitalizing on the room's morbid history, using it as a selling point to attract guests who were intrigued by the supernatural. I slammed my hand down on the desk, causing him to jump. You exploited the victims suffering for profit. You knowingly put people in danger. And for what? A couple extra bucks? He looked at me then, a hint of remorse flickering in his eyes. But he said nothing. Instead, he bowed his head in guilty silence. The confrontation left a bitter taste in my mouth. I had to uncover the truth. The truth the hotel manager had chosen to ignore. Room 313 wasn't just a paranormal oddity. It was a death trap. As I stood before the room, its dark aura seemed to pulsate with unseen energy, as if awaiting my return. My heart pounded in my chest as I pushed open the door, stepping into the room that had now become an all-too-familiar haunting ground. With the room's secrets unveiled, the atmosphere felt more oppressive than before. The walls, stained with untold pain and sorrow, seemed to close in on me, but I squared my shoulders, fortified my resolve, and spoke into the silent gloom. I know what happened here. I know about the curse. Cold wind swept through the room, sending shivers down my spine. Shadows danced in the corners, forming spectral silhouettes of their victims. I know you're all victims, victims of a horrendous betrayal. I promise you, I will bring justice to your untimely deaths. The response was immediate. A surge of paranormal activity washed over me. The ethereal figures appeared, their ghostly faces contorted in pain and anger. One, more solid than the rest, stepped forward. The Founder. His spectral eyes were full of torment as they bore into mine. We seek peace, his voice echoed through the room, a chilling sound that seemed to come from every direction. Can you offer us that, detective? I can, and I will, I responded, holding a spectral gaze. But I need your help. I need to know everything. A moment of silence passed before the room convulsed violently. The chandelier swayed, lights flickered, and a cold gust blew around me, turning into a vortex. I felt the room closing in on me, the darkness creeping over my senses. No, I shouted above the cacophony, the room shaking as if the very foundations of the hotel were rebelling against me. I won't be your next victim. I'm here to help you. With every ounce of strength I had left, I pulled myself towards the door, fighting against the unseen forces trying to keep me. The door handle was ice cold, numbing my fingers. I yanked it open and tumbled outside, gasping for breath. As I lay on the corridor, the carpeted floor underneath me, the room settled. The door slammed shut. 
the final showdown had been draining, the room testing my resolve and nearly claiming me in the process. The following days were a blur of restless activity. I pored over every bit of evidence I had on room 313, cross-referencing with public records and local news archives. The daunting puzzle began to piece itself together, painting a bleak picture of a hotel exploiting its dark history for profit. I arranged a press conference. The thought of standing in front of the media, my words echoing in their microphones, sent a shiver down my spine. But the victims... The victims deserved their stories to be heard. As the cameras began to roll and the reporters hushed, I took a deep breath and began. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today, not as Detective Michael Turner, but as a spokesperson for the forgotten souls of Room 313. I told them everything. The birthday curse, the victims, the spectral encounters, most importantly, the hotel manager's role in exploiting the tragedy. Their silence told me they were shocked, but I could also see the wheels turning, connecting the dots. After the press conference, I confronted the hotel manager again. This time, I had the eyes of the public on my side. You've played with lives, disregarded the dead, and for what? I spat out, slamming the damned evidence on his desk. A bit of profit? A little thrill? The manager, pale and shaken, had no choice but to accept responsibility. We will take steps to correct this, to remember the victims properly, he stammered, his previous arrogance long gone. The hotel was forced to address its haunted past. Room 313 was sealed with a plaque put out as a memorial to the victims, acknowledging their unjust demise. A promise of reform was made to prevent further exploitation of the paranormal events within the hotel. As I left the hotel for the last time, I glanced back at room 313. There was a silence, a sense of relief that seemed to resonate from it. The victims were no longer a tragic tale spun for profit. Their memories were respected, their stories heard. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I'd carried their stories, their hopes for justice, and we had won. As I walked away, the haunting echoes of room 313 seemed quieter, softer. A step towards peace, towards redemption, for them as well as for me. The gentle sway of the train car had always been soothing to me. As a regional sales manager for a large pharmaceutical company, I spent more time on the railway than I did in my own bed. The rhythmic clack of the wheels on the tracks was my lullaby, the ever-changing landscape outside my window, a constant companion. This particular Tuesday evening found me on yet another overnight train, heading from Chicago to New York for a critical meeting. I settled into my usual routine, laptop out, spreadsheet open, cup of mediocre coffee cooling on the fold-down tray. The first sign that something was amiss came about three hours into the journey. I glanced at my watch, frowning slightly. We should have reached Cleveland by now, but the cityscape outside remained stubbornly rural. Fields and forests rolled by, bathed in the eerie glow of a full moon. I flagged down a passing attendant, a middle-aged woman with graying hair, and a pinched expression. Excuse me, but shouldn't we have reached Cleveland by now? She gave me a strange look, her eyes slightly unfocused. Cleveland? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not familiar with that stop. Perhaps you're thinking of a different route. Before I could respond, she hurried away, disappearing into the next car. I sat back, puzzled. How could she not know Cleveland? It was a major stop on this line. I shook my head, chalking it up to a new employee, and returned to my work. As the hours ticked by, my unease grew. The landscape outside never changed, an endless loop of moonlit fields and shadowy forests. My phone had lost signal a long time ago, and my watch seemed to be malfunctioning, its hands spinning wildly before stopping altogether. I decided to stretch my legs, hoping a walk through the train might clear my head. 
As I made my way through the cars, I noticed how eerily quiet it was. The few passengers I saw sat motionless in their seats, staring blankly ahead or out the window. In the dining car, I found an elderly man hunched over a cup of coffee. His wrinkled hands trembled slightly as he lifted the mug to his lips. Excuse me, I said, sliding into the seat beside him. I don't mean to bother you, but have you noticed anything strange about this journey? The old man's roomy eyes focused on me, a flicker of recognition passing across his face. You're new here, aren't you? He said, his voice a dry whisper. First time on this line. I nodded, a chill running down my spine. What do you mean, this line? This is just the regular Chicago to New York route, isn't it? He let out a wheezing laugh that turned into a cough. Oh, my boy, this ain't no regular route. This here is the last line. Ain't no New York we're heading for. I don't understand, I said, my heart beginning to race. Where are we going, then? The old man leaned in closer, the smell of stale coffee on his breath. Nowhere, he whispered. Everywhere. This train don't stop, son. It just keeps on going, round and round, a world without end. I jerked back, convinced I was dealing with a madman. That's impossible. Every train has to stop eventually. He just smiled, a sad, knowing expression. You go on believing that if it makes you feel better, but mark my words, you'll see. We all figure it out, sooner or later. I stood up abruptly, nearly knocking over my chair. You're crazy. This, this is just a normal train. We'll, we'll be in New York by morning. As I turned to go, the old man called out. What's your name, son? I hesitated for a moment. Jack. Jack Thurston. Well, Jack Thurston, I'm Howard. I'll be seeing you around. We got all the time in the world, after all. I hurried back to my seat, Howard's words echoing in my mind. It, it was nonsense, of course. Trains, trains don't go on forever. There had to be a rational explanation for the delay and the strange behavior of the staff. As I sank into my seat, I noticed a young woman across the aisle, furiously scribbling in a notebook. Her long, dark hair fell in a curtain around her face, and her legs bounced with nervous energy. Excuse me, I said, leaning towards her. I don't suppose you know when we're due to arrive in New York, do you? She looked up, her eyes wide and slightly manic. New York? She repeated, letting out a hysterical little giggle. Oh, honey, there is no New York, not anymore. There's only the train. I felt my blood run cold. What, what are you talking about? She leaned in close, her voice dropping to a whisper. I've been on this train for I don't know how long. Days, weeks, it all blurs together. But I've figured it out. We're not going anywhere. We're stuck in a loop. A never-ending journey to nowhere. I shook my head, refusing to believe it. That's impossible. You, you're just confused. Maybe, maybe you fell asleep and missed your stop. She laughed again, a sound devoid of humor. Oh, oh I wish it were that simple. But look around you. Have you seen anyone get off? Have we stopped at any stations? This isn't a normal train, Jack. This is something else entirely. I started at the sound of my name. How do you know my name? She smiled, a sad, knowing expression. I heard you talking to old Howard in the dining car. I'm Lisa, by the way. Welcome aboard the Eternal Express. I stood up abruptly, my, my head spinning. This is crazy. All, all of you are insane. I'm, I'm going to go find the conductor and get some answers. As I stormed off towards the front of the train, I heard Lisa call out behind me. Good luck. Don't say I didn't warn you. I made my way through the cars, each one identical to the last. The same faded blue seats, the same 
flickering overhead lights, the same black-faced passengers staring into nothingness. How long had I been walking? It felt like, like hours, but that was impossible in, in a train of normal length. Finally, I reached what should have been the engine car. Instead of a locomotive, I found myself in another passenger car, exactly like all the others. I spun around, disoriented. How could this be? A hand on my shoulder made me jump. I turned to find the attendant from earlier, her pinched face now twisted into an unnaturally wide smile. Can I help you, sir? She asked, her voice sickly sweet. I need to speak with a conductor, I said, trying to keep the panic out of my voice. There, there's been some kind of mistake. This, this train should have reached New York by now. She smiled and it never wavered. I'm sorry, sir, but there's no conductor. There's no mistake either. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. I backed away from her, my heart pounding. What is this place? What's happening? She tilted her head, her eyes suddenly black and empty. This is the last line, Mr. Thurston. The train that never stops, never ends. You bought a ticket, and now you're on the ride of eternity. I turned and ran, pushed past confused passengers, my breath coming in ragged gasps. This, this couldn't be happening. It had to be a dream, a hallucination, anything, anything but reality. I burst into the space between cars, the cold night air hitting me like a slap. The door to the next car was just a few feet away. If I could reach it, maybe I could find a way out of this nightmare train. But as I stepped forward, the gap between the cars began to stretch. The next door moved further and further away, no matter how far I ran. The wind howled around me, drowning out my screams of infuriation and fear. And suddenly a hand grabbed my arm, yanking me back into the car. I fell to the floor, gasping for breath. Lisa stood over me, her face pale in the flickering light. Are you crazy? She hissed. You can't go out there. Between the cars, that's, that's where it gets you. Where what gets you? I asked, my voice shaking. She helped me to my feet, glancing nervously at the door. The thing that runs the train. The thing that brought us all here. Trust me, you don't want to meet it. As if on cue, a low, rumbling sound echoed through the car. It was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Part machine, part animal. All wrong. The lights flickered more intently. For a moment, I could have sworn I saw something massive moving in the shadow between the cars. Lisa pulled me back to my seat, her grip on my arm almost painful. Listen, listen to me, she said urgently. I know this is hard to accept. God knows I fought against it for... I don't even know how long. But, but, but fighting... Fighting only makes it worse. You have to accept where you are, or, or you'll go mad. I slumped in my seat, my mind reeling. But why? Why is this happening? What is this place? She shook her head. I don't know. None of us do. All we know is that we're here, on this never-ending journey. Some think it's hell, others purgatory. Old Howard thinks it's some kind of cosmic mistake. Me? I think it's just the universe's way of saying, Tough luck, kiddo. I looked out the window, watching the same moonlit landscape roll by. How many times had I seen those same fields, those same trees? How long would I continue to see them? So what do we do? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Lisa gave me a sad smile. We ride. We talk. We try to stay sane. We hope that maybe, just maybe, one day we'll reach the last stop. As the train rolled on into the endless night, I realized with a sinking heart that my journey had only just begun. The destination, that remained a terrifying mystery. 
Days blended into nights and nights into days. The monotonous rhythm of the train became the backdrop to my existence. I lost count of how many times I'd watched the same scenery roll by. How many times I'd walked the length of the train, hoping to find something, anything different. Lisa became my anchor in this sea of madness. She spent hours talking, sharing stories of our lives before the train. She had been a journalist, always chasing the next big story. Guess I found it, she would say with a bitter laugh, gesturing at our surroundings. Old Howard joined us often, his weathered face a map of time he'd spent on this hellish journey. Been riding this train for longer than I can remember, he'd say his roomy old eyes distant. Seen folks come and go. Some just disappear. Others, well, he'd trail off, shaking his head. I learned to fear the space between the cars. Sometimes, late at night, when the train's rhythm seemed to falter, we'd hear things, scraping, slithering sounds. Once I caught a glimpse of something massive and dark undulating past the windows lisa pulled me away before i could get a good look trust me you don't want to know the other passengers were a mix of resigned and the mad like us they tried to maintain some semblance of normalcy others had given into despair sitting in the same spot day after day staring blankly at nothing then there were those who'd lost their minds entirely, prowling the cars with wild eyes and incoherent ramblings. One such soul was called Preacher, tall and menacing with a tangled beard and eyes that burned with fanatical fervor. He would roam the train, shouting about sins and redemption. We're all here for a reason. He'd bellow, spittle flying from his lips. This is our punishment, our penance, I say penance. Repent, and maybe, just maybe, you'll find your way off this damn train. Most ignored him, but some listened. I watched as he gathered a small following, passengers desperate for any explanation, any hope of escape. It was on what I guessed to be my hundredth day on the train that Things took a darker turn. I was jolted awake by screams coming from the front of the car. Lisa was already on her feet, her face a mask of terror. They've done it, she whispered. They've actually done it. I followed her gaze to see a group of the preacher's followers dragging a struggling passenger towards the door between the cars. The preacher stood by, his arms raised, chanting something I couldn't make out over the victim's screams. What are you doing? I asked, The part of me already knew the answer. A sacrifice, old Howard said, his voice grim. Fools think they can appease whatever's running the train. Buy their way off with blood. I started to move towards them, but Lisa held me back. Don't. There's nothing we can do. Just, just don't watch. But I couldn't look away. The group reached the door, and with a final triumphant cry from the preacher... To shove their victim out into the space between cars. For a moment, nothing happened. Then came a sound. A wet, tearing sound that would haunt my nightmares for days to come. The door slammed shut, cutting off the screams. The preacher turned his face to the rest of us, his eyes wide with excitement. It's done. The unworthy has been cast out. Soon we shall reach our final destination. But the train rolled on, unchanged. Hours passed, then days. No final stop, no salvation. Just the endless journey and the growing madness of the preacher and his flock. More sacrifices followed. The train's population dwindled as passenger after passenger was thrown to whatever lurked below the cars. Those of us who refused to join the preacher's cult banded together, watching each other's backs, 
sleeping in shifts. It was during one of my watch shifts that I first saw her. A little girl, no more than seven or eight, wandering alone through the car. Her pink dress was pristine, her blonde hair neatly braided. She looked so out of place in this nightmare that for a moment I thought she was a hallucination. Hello, I said softly, not wanting to scare her. Are you lost? She turned to me, and I had to stifle a gasp. Her eyes were completely black, like empty voids in her small face. When she spoke, her voice was old, ancient even. Lost, she repeated. No, I don't think so. I know exactly where I am. Do you? What are you? I whispered. I felt a chill run down my spine. She smiled, revealing teeth that were just a little bit too sharp. I'm a passenger like you. We're all passengers here, Jack. All of us, riding the rails to eternity. How do you know my name? I asked, though I dreaded the answer. I know everyone's name, she said, her black eyes boring into mine. I know why you're here. I know their sins, their fears, their deepest, darkest secrets. Would you like to know yours, Jack? I backed away, my heart pounding. Stay away from me, I said, my voice shaking. She laughed, a sound like breaking glass. Oh, Jack, you can't run from me. You can't run from any of this. You bought your ticket. Now you have to ride. I blinked and she was gone. It just vanished as if she'd never been there at all. I slumped in my seat, my mind reeling. Was I lost? Had I finally snapped like so many others in this godforsaken train? I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew, Lisa was shaking me awake. Her face was pale, her eyes wide with fear. Jack, something happened. The train, it's, it's slowing down. I sat up, suddenly alert. She, she was right. For the first time since this nightmare began, I could feel the train deaccelerating. The familiar clack of wheels on tracks was slowing, becoming more distinct. Passengers were stirring, looking around in confusion and hope. Even the preacher and his followers had stopped their mad ranting staring out the windows with a mixture of fear and anticipation. Are we stopping? I asked, hardly daring to believe it. Old Howard shook his head, his expression grim. Don't get your hopes up, son. In all my time here, I've never known this train to stop. Whatever's happening, it ain't gonna be good. As if to punctuate his words, the lights in the car began to flicker more intensely than I'd ever seen them. The temperature dropped rapidly, our breath fogging in the suddenly frigid air. Then, with a great screeching of metal on metal, the train ground to a halt. For a moment, there was absolute silence. We all held our breath, waiting, hoping, fearing. Then, with a hiss of hydraulics, the doors slid open. Finally, the preacher cried, pushing his way towards the exit. Our salvation is at hand. Come, brothers and sisters, let us... His words were cut off by a scream of pure terror. As he stepped off the train, something grabbed him. Something huge and dark and impossible. In the blink of an eye, he was gone, leaving nothing behind but a spreading pool of blood on the platform. Chaos erupted. Passengers pushed and shoved, some trying to get off the train, others desperately attempting to close the doors. I lost sight of Lisa in the pandemonium. And through it all, I heard laughter. The same glass-like sound from beyond. I turned to see the little girl with the black eyes standing calmly in the middle of the mayhem. Welcome to the last stop, Jack, she said, her voice cutting through the screams and cries. Are you ready to get off? As I stared into those bottomless black pits, I realized, with dawning horror, that our endless journey had only just begun. The real nightmare 
was only starting. Somewhere in the distance, I heard the sound of a train whistle, signaling the departure to our next unknown destination. The chaos around me faded into a dull roar, and I stared into the little girl's black eyes. Time seemed to, to slow. In that moment, I had a sudden, crystal-clear realization. This was a test. The endless train ride, the maddening repetition, the horror I'd witnessed. It had all been leading to this moment of choice. No, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. No, I'm not getting off. Not here. Not like this. The little girl's smile faltered for a split second. A crack in her otherworldly composure. You don't have a choice, Jack. Everyone has to get off eventually. I stood my ground, even as I heard more screams from the platform, more passengers being dragged into the darkness. There's always a choice. He told me I bought a ticket to ride. Well, I'm not ready for it to end. Her eyes narrowed. Can't stay on the train forever, Jack. Doesn't work like that. Watch me, I growled, turning away from her and pushing through the panicked crowd. I had to find Lisa. I had to find Howard. We'd survived this long together. I, I wasn't about to leave them behind. I spotted Howard first, huddled in a corner, his eyes wide with terror. Come on, we need to move, said grabbing his arm. Where? There's nowhere to go. It, it's got us. It, it's finally got us. I shook him, perhaps more roughly than I intended. Listen to me, this, this isn't the end. It's only just another part of the journey. We have to stick together. We need to find Lisa. Something in my voice must have reached him, because he nodded and stumbled to his feet. We pushed through the crowd, searching desperately for Lisa's familiar face. We found her near the front of the car, trying to pull other passengers back from the door. Lisa, we have to go, I called out. She turned, relief flooding her face when she saw me. Go where? In case you haven't noticed, we're a little short on options here. I pointed towards the back of the train. We keep going. This thing has to end somewhere, and I don't think it's here. As if in response to my words, I heard the train whistle again, louder this time. The engine was starting up. It's leaving. We have to get off now. Howard said, his eyes wide. Or we'll be trapped forever, I finished for him. I got news for you, Howard. We're already trapped. Have been since we first stepped on board. But now we've got a chance to find the real way out. Lisa looked at me, understanding, dawning in her eyes. You think this is all part of it, don't you? The final test. It has to be. And I'm not failing it by giving in now. The train lurched, beginning to move. Around us, the last of the passengers were either fleeing onto the platform or collapsing in despair. It's now or never, I said. Are you with me? Lisa grabbed my hand without hesitation. Howard hesitated for a moment, looking longingly at the door, but then took Lisa's other hand. Right. Let's see where this crazy train takes us. As the train picked up speed, we made our way towards the back, pushing against the tide of terrified passengers. The little girl appeared again, her face contorted with rage. You can't do this. You have to get off. Everyone gets off. Not today, I told her, pushing past. We reached the final car, just as the platform disappeared from view. Through the windows, we could see only darkness. Not the familiar darkness of night, but an absolute void, empty of all light and substance. The train picked up speed rattling and shaking more violently than ever before. We huddled together, bracing ourselves against the walls of the car. What now? Lisa yelled. We wait, and we don't let go. The darkness outside seemed to press in on us, seeping through the windows like a living thing. The lights in the car flickered and died, plunging us into darkness. I could feel Lisa's hand in mine, Howard's presence at my side but I couldn't see them. Then, just as suddenly as it had began, the shaking stopped. The oppressive darkness lifted for the first time in what felt like an eternity, and the train began to slow. Sunlight, 
real warm, beautiful sunlight streamed through the windows. I blinked my eyes, unused to the brightness after so long in the train's artificial light. As my vision cleared, I saw that we were pulling into a station, a real station, with people waiting on the platform, going about their daily lives as if nothing was amiss. The train came to a gentle stop. The doors opened with a familiar hiss. For a moment, none of us moved, afraid that this was just another trick, another test. Then Howard let out a whoop of joy and rushed for the door. Lisa and I followed, stepping out onto the platform with shaky legs. The station read, Grand Central Station. We'd made it. We were in New York. As we stood there, breathless and disbelieving, I felt a tug on my sleeve. I turned to see the little girl with the black eyes. But now, when the sunlight, she looked different, normal, just like a regular kid with brown eyes and a confused expression. Excuse me. Is this the train to Chicago? I knelt down to her level, smiling. No, sweetheart, this train just came from Chicago, but trust me, you don't want to get on it. She nodded, thanking me, and ran off to find her parents. I watched her go, a weight lifting from my chest. Lisa squeezed my hand. Is it really over? She asked, her voice barely a whisper. I looked at her, then at Howard than at the bustling station around us. Yeah, I think it is, I said, finally allowing myself to believe. So we made our way out of the station and into the bright New York morning. I knew that the memories of our endless journey would stay with us forever. But we had faced the darkness, made our choices, and found our way back to the light. And if I ever saw a train again, it'd be too soon.